Welcome to our lecture online. Now let's talk about the energy content in a pulsar and how much energy a pulsar loses every single second. And that, of course, causes the pulsar to slow down. The answer is yes. Does the pulsar slow down? It does slow down. The rotation begins to slow. It's kind of like what happens to the Earth because of the Moon. There's interaction, a gravitational interaction between the Moon and the Earth, so therefore we have what we call tidal forces. Those tidal forces cause the Earth to swell and shrink and swell and shrink in the direction where the Moon is, not just cause the water to go up and down, but also the land to go up and down. And all that internal friction takes energy out of the Earth, and the Earth pays for that in terms of its rotational kinetic energy, which causes the Earth to slow down. The Earth, before the Moon was formed, rotated on its axis about every six hours. Since the Moon has come about because of a huge collision between some object and the Earth, the Moon has caused the Earth to slow down to about 24 hours per day, and given another half a billion years and about 500 million years, a day will even last 26 hours instead of 24. So the Earth is continuing to slow down. Pulsars do the same thing because of the energy emission. The energy has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the rotational kinetic energy. So, let's take a look at the rotational kinetic energy. It's equal to one-half the moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. And so the moment of inertia for a solid ball is two-fifths mr squared, and then we multiply times the rotational speed squared. So we take one-half times two-fifths, times 1.4 1, 1 times the mass of the Sun. So the pulsar inside the Crab Nebula is about 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. And we multiply times the radius of the pulsar squared, which is about 10 kilometers squared in meters. And then we multiply the times the angular velocity. It goes around in its axis 2 pi, that's 2 pi radians, one revolution, every 0 0.033 seconds because it flashes about 30 times per second, which gives us a, a pulse of 0 0.033 seconds. So we have to square that ratio. We multiply everything out. We realize that the kinetic energy, the rotational energy, the energy that the pulsar has because of its rotation, its very rapid rotation, is 2 times 10 to the 42 joules. All right, that's a lot of energy. Now, how much energy does the pulsar lose? Well, we have a hard time trying to measure that by measuring all its radiation, but what we can do is we can notice that the pulsar is actually slowing down. Very, very small amounts per second, very, very small amounts per day and per year, but as we observe that pulsar, we can see that there's a very, very minute uh, change in its velocity. So P is the period. So if that's the period currently, we can see that the change in the period, this is a, a way of writing the change in the period with respect to time, p dot, is equal to 10 to the minus 12.4. So there's a very, very slight amount of slowdown that we can actually measure. So then we can figure out the change in kinetic energy by taking the, the difference of energy with respect to time, which is minus 4 pi squared, that's 2 pi quantity squared, times the moment of inertia, times the change in the period divided by the period cubed. When we take the derivative of 1 over p squared, we get 1 over p cubed. That's where the negative comes from because it's a slowdown or change in the energy in a negative direction. So knowing that the moment of inertia, when we take 2 fifth mr squared, is about 10 to the 38 kilograms meter squared, plug that all in there, we get a change in the energy per unit time, so that's a change in energy per second, of an 4 times 10 to the 31 joules. Hmm, so what does that really mean? Well, take a look at how we compare that. If we compare that to its original, to its original energy, we can see that it's changing 2 times 10 to the minus 9% per second. So that is, would be per second. So that's not a, not a lot of change. 2 times 10 to the minus 9 of its original energy per second. Now, if we compare that energy output by how much energy the, the sun puts out, notice that the sun, every second, puts out 3.86 times 10 to the 26 joules. Let's call it about 4 times 10 to the 26 joules. How does the energy expulsion of the pulsar compare to how much energy the sun puts out? And you would be surprised to see that ratio. So I divide the amount of energy the pulsar puts out every second by the amount of energy the sun puts out every second, and notice that ratio is 100,000 to 1. In other words, the energy coming from the pulsar is the amount of 100 
thousand suns. Wow, not bad for a remnant of a supernova. This is just a ball of nuclear material squished together very, very tightly, radius of 10 kilometers, spinning really fast, but the amount of energy lost by that, by that pulsar is the equivalent of the energy lost by the sun every single second, 100,000 to one. Imagine that. So the pulsar still produces vast quantities of energy, which is what causes the nebula around the pulsar to light up in the visible light, in radio radiation, in infrared radiation, in UV, X-ray, and gamma, it has an enormous amount of energy still being expelled on the, on the second to second basis, and will do that for a long time to come. Now, obviously, we can see how long it can do that. It's not going to be a linear curve. It's going to be an exponential curve. But uh, you can see that there's an enormous amount of energy being emitted from the pulsar on a the, on the second to second basis. Just absolutely phenomenal. And that's how we can tell. What happens to planets if there happen to be planets around pulsars? Well, there actually are pulsars that have planets around them. We've actually uh, measured the uh, influence of the uh, planets. I don't think anybody's living on them. And uh, so I don't think those planets really care. <laughs> well, it's orbits and everything. Um, it will change somewhat. Uh, obviously, there used to be a really big star, and now that star has lost a lot of its mass because of its, uh, of its explosion. That mass is being converted into that nebula. So the remaining mass is smaller, so the planets would probably have larger orbits at a greater radius. Uh, but other than that, and being bombarded by all kinds of radiation, other than that, nothing much would happen to the planets. Would it lose the planet? No, not likely. So I, the outermost planets? Um, no, I wouldn't think so. I think so. it still would be in gravitational contact. But I was just thinking, what would happen if they had atmospheres? Would the atmosphere be blown away and all that? That I'm not sure. I guess it depends upon how close uh, the planets were at the time of the explosion. Now, in this particular case, we don't know of any planets. But we have seen pulsars with planets around them. Which begs the question, what happened to those planets during the explosion? Have you ever seen uh, power to the negative, negative 12 point? Negative 12.4. It's an interesting way of putting it, yeah. Is that an astronomy thing? They just put it in that format. It's just a ratio. It's just how fast per second the period is changing. So that would be in, uh, the period would be in terms of seconds per, I guess seconds per second. Kind of a strange way of putting it. <laughs>